Not the airfield, which is just like hundreds the world over. Not the planes. You've seen a kitty hawk before. But there is something unique in the picture. It's the pilot. He could be Johnny Brown from London or Elmer Dokes from Denver, but he's not. He's Leon from Chongqing, China. This man is a Chinese air cadet, one of hundreds over in the States to take a postgraduate course in flying, combat flying. First, they learn to speak English. And blow as you see me do, everybody. I have written a sentence here using the letter P wherever it was possible. So I'm going to have you say for me, after listening to me, say this sentence with me. The pilot will presently place the plane properly. All together. The pilot will presently the Chinese held off the Japs for six years with rusty rifles, obsolete planes and plenty of guts. But now, to win, and win quickly, they must have the best. Their pilots are learning to use such up-to-date equipment as the Norden bombsite. These men are cadets, but unlike most cadets, they know what war really means. They remember how they stood by helplessly when Jap planes killed their mothers, fathers and brothers and destroyed their homes. So now they are patiently learning the latest methods of waging war, both in the classroom and in the air. young men are going back to China. Then, with their experience, their courage, and with real fighting equipment, they are going to get their revenge. <laughs> young China sings of the new world it is going to build. Looks like something out of the pictures, doesn't it, eh? You hear what they're playing? That's right, that's where we are, deep in the art of. This is Rodeo Day in Phoenix, Texas. Everybody aims to spend it in the saddle, if they can get there. We couldn't make it because we was on a small um, op, see? Cowboys and cowgirls for the day, everybody turns out and follows the band. One or two of our lads got roped in too. These ranches can half ride, just like their old dads did in the days of Buffalo Bill. Why, there is the old timer himself. That's one way of making sure of your meat ration. Cool, what a cow, eh? You know, they reckon this horse will run for president next year. It's not knowing how to stick on that counts. It's knowing how to get off. Blimey. Oh. That's truth. Wonderful sense of humor they got these chaps, you know. 
They didn't ought to let him out, did they? It's a lot of bull, ain't it, eh? London. For the first time in history, the RAF flag flew from the tower of Westminster Abbey. The occasion, Battle of Britain Sunday. It seems appropriate that while the Battle of Germany is on, London stops to remember a handful of men who fought another battle, which now seems so long ago. For if the Battle of Britain had been lost, there might never have been a second front, and the last hope of freedom might have gone forever. Past the guard of honor of sergeant pilots came many personalities of the Air Force. The most notable, perhaps, Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding, who was Chief of Fighter Command throughout the battle. In addition to the RAF, there were many others who, no matter how busy they might be, found time to pay their respects. His Excellency Monsieur Feodor Gusev, the Soviet Ambassador. General Sir Frederick Pyle, the Anti-Aircraft Command. The Right Honourable Clement R. Attlee, Deputy Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Sir Archibald Sinclair, Secretary of State for Air. Today, over the fields of Western Europe, the few who fell battling against so many are being avenged. In this conference room are seven men. Seven men who planned the greatest air effort of all time, the Second Front. Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory, Commander-in-Chief Allied Expeditionary Air Force. Getting up to explain a point is Major General Butler, Deputy Commander-in-Chief. Air Vice Marshal Wigglesworth, SASO. There's a familiar face. Yes, it's Air Marshal Sir Arthur Cunningham, now AOC of the Second Tactical Air Force. With him is Major General Brereton, who now commands the First Allied Airborne Army. These are the men who planned. Now we can see what their planning has done. The beaches of Normandy echoed with the rattle of winches. The Allies were unloading, unloading lorries and trucks, bombs and shells, tanks and guns, unloading men. A great striking force was being assembled. The beachhead was small, almost too small to hold the thousands of tons of material piling up hour by hour. The fields of Normandy were crammed with the means of making war. On the roads, the service police directed endless streams of traffic. At key points, they coped with as many as 10,000 vehicles a day. The roads of Normandy, too, were crammed with the means of making war. The beachhead was the greatest bombing target of all time. But the only planes over the beachhead were Allied planes, Spitfires and Mustangs keeping watch and ward. They watched over the LSTs bringing the precious cargo from England to the beaches. They watched over the ducks carrying it from the beaches to the dumps. They watched over the lorries taking it from the dumps to the forward areas. The Luftwaffe stayed away. The RAF was digging in. The standing corn was going down under the tracks of bulldozers. The sappers were laying down runways as easily as laying lino on the floor. The airfields were completed as fast as the squadrons could take them over. From factory chimneys and other observation posts only a shell's throw away, the Germans watched the airfields. They watched the activities of typhoon squadrons commanded by such aces as Group Captain Tim Maurice. For here in Normandy, the RAF was using a new form of aerial artillery the rocket-firing Typhoon. This weapon was giving the enemy his biggest headache, a headache caused by a six-inch shell traveling at 700 miles an hour, a projectile able to pierce the armor of any tank yet built. The men of the rocket Typhoons were on call all the hours of daylight. 
But in spite of this, they always manage to find the odd pause for relaxation, the odd minute for those all-important chores. The enemy shells caused damage, but the enemy shells did not interfere with business. The typhoons might have concentrated on the enemy gunners, but there were bigger fish to fry. The Germans, too, were trying to build up a striking force, but the German supply routes were open to attack. Typhoons had their losses, but they were light. In this case, the pilot escaped unharmed. The Allies attacked. Bomber target indicators went down with the first shells of the artillery. Fleets of Lancasters and Halifaxes cascaded bombs onto the German positions. and infantry went forward. Fresh waves of bombers switched the attack to individual strong points. This was bombardment indeed. The Seventh Army was battered and stunned. It was outflanked and caught in a pocket, the Falaise's pocket. Through a rapidly closing gap, the enemy convoys dashed out in an effort to escape. But wherever they went, death went with them. days the RAF destroyed 5,000 vehicles. The roads from Falaise began to smoke with the burning wreckage of von Kluger's army.
Allied forces raced on. As they went, this is what they saw. An army had been splattered over the roads of France. Tanks and troop carriers, mobile guns and mortars, cars and carts, papers and photographs, shoes and socks, horses and men. This is the meaning of the term air power. The Battle of Normandy opened the doors of Europe. The march on Berlin has begun.